three, two, one. This is the Chargers Unleashed Podcast. Here are your hosts, Dan Wolkenstein and Jake Hefner. Welcome to another edition of Chargers Unleashed. Jake Hefner and Dan Wolkenstein here with you from the LA Football Network. Today's show, of course, is being brought to you by Bet Online, Charger Bull Family, Rock Solid Sports Memorabilia. If this is your first time tuning into the show, make sure to hit that like and subscribe button on YouTube. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. Dan Wolkenstein, preseason game number one for the Chargers is in the books. Some majority good takeaways. There are some things that we do need to go into a little bit more detail about a couple question marks that are still out there and looming. Um, we'll call it, call it what you will overreaction Sunday or overreaction Monday. If we're talking about today. Um, but overall, a lot of things that we expected to happen, a lot of things that we would hope that would happen for certain players. Um, even in a loss, I actually came away with a hell of a lot more positivity than I did negativity for this team. Um, but anyways, how the hell was your weekend? Football's back. Football is back, Jake. Yes. Welcome to Chargers Unleashed, ladies and gentlemen. Um, we have a fun show today. Uh, my weekend was fantastic. I was able to watch football for the most part all weekend, which was great. Uh, was able to go to SoFi with the Bolt fam and everyone else that was there. SoFi was great. Uh, the game, the only thing I will say, Jake, is seven o'clock, p- seven o'clock start times for games. Like, that's rough, man. Like, getting home at like midnight, like, woof, not fun. Hey, just, just be thankful it's on a Saturday, my friend. That is true. This is true. Um, so yeah, so today, Jake, we get to go over all things Chargers versus Rams recap, uh, the highs and lows, some of the kind of key takeaways from the game on Saturday. Um, I think overall, Jake, off the top, I think we can all agree like some of like the key performers, which we're going to get into all the specifics, but key takeaways that I took on the rapid fire, Chris Rumpf stronger, Michael Bandy, Joe Reed. They're here making it interesting. Uh, Dean Leonard is a seventh round draft pick. Uh, Damon Lloyd still tackling JK Scott, still punting to the moon and QB Josh two, Kelly three. look improved. Josh Kelly and Isaiah Spiller both look pretty good. Uh, and missed tackles is still an issue. Did I miss anything? I'm sure you did, but we're <laughs> going to talk about it. So, Cool. All right, Jake. So before, we get, before we get into all the craziness, uh, over or under how many times Bryce Perkins' name is going to get get brought up in the 2022 season once the regular season starts? I'm going to go over or under 1.5 mentions. So you're saying this in, in like questioning if – if Bryce Perkins comes in to replace Matthew Stafford, essentially, how, how many times will his name get brought up on a broadcast during the 2022 regular season? I mean, because honestly, he was like an MVP. I mean, it lo- <laughs> sure as hell looked like it with the way that he was eluding <laughs> our tackles. Um, you know what? You said 1.5 was the line. Yeah. Over an 18 week season. Yeah, I'll go over. Okay. I'll go over. Love what it. the hell? Nice. We'll pay the bills with the money you're about to win off the over because I made it really low, but that's okay. <laughs> yeah, definitely. At least you set the bar at a good spot. Anyways, Bet Online is the fastest and easiest way to wager on all your favorite sports contests and events with first to market odds and lines. Find reviews and news for every league, including Major League Baseball, NFL, NBA, NHL, combat sports, esports, and even golf. Bet Online continues to be the top online resource for all of your sports information from live in game betting, props, and futures. Head on over to Bet Online today or use your promo, uh, <laughs> use your mobile device, not your promo code. I'll tell the promo code in a second. Mobile device to join today and make your first sports bet using the now promo code Believe50. That's B L E A V 5 0 to receive your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Bet Online where the game starts. Okay, Jake, let's go ahead and kick this thing off. Uh, charge with a coin toss and elect to receive. And with that, Joe Reed's actually kick returner, which I was like, oh, Joe Reed's sighting. That was a nice surprise. Here we go. First drive by Chase Daniel, starting off as QB1 in the first half. Uh, I think Easton Stick was second half. But you see, you saw Joshua Kelly show kind of a new rejuvenated Joshua Kelly. Physical, fast, uh, more decisive, it seemed. Um, you saw him catching stuff out of the backfield as well as rushing. And then Joe Reed, like 47-yard touchdown catch, which given how much he's gone through as a player yep. and off the field, not being able to get there, like it, 
you could tell how much that game meant to him. Joe Reed looked good. Joshua Kelly looked good. Offensive line looked good. I think that's where he first got to see Jamari Sawyer, got to see Zion Johnson. Both of them looked pretty darn good as well. Um, so starting off on offense, I would say Chargers look pretty good. And starting off on defense, Chargers look pretty good. And then it kind of changed. <laughs> yeah, it kind of went through some ebbs and flows and then some drastic peaks and valleys. And then there were more valleys than there were peaks, of course. But um, yeah, overall from the first drive, Dan, I, I thought it looked I thought it looked all right. You know, I thought that the Chargers were aggressive. The run game was working. Obviously, Joshua Kelly uh, getting that opportunity to start. 28, 28 yards on uh, on four catches, I believe it was, and then 44 yards off of six uh, six carries. So decent for the time that he was in that game. Looked fresh, as it sounded like from his comments that he had earlier on last week, that everything that he's been doing, it looks early on that those returns are coming to fruition. And again, when we were talking about who's been the guy to lead the candidacy for the RB three out of the rest of the pack between Kelly Roundtree marks and um, uh, Letty Brown, excuse me. Uh, he's been the one that's been in the lead. And again, not by a wide margin, but he was in the lead in practice. Definitely in this game. I think he has taken the reins of that. We'll see obviously what changes over the next two weeks, if anything changes, but uh, moving on to Joe Reed. I mean, that, 41 yard touchdown pass and to, and then to still be involved later on in the game. I thought that it was just, it was a great sign for him. Here we More go. With this 61 battle. yards. Yep. Here we go with this battle again between him and Michael Banny. That's definitely going to make things interesting when we're coming to final cut decisions, but I thought that was great. I, I think, uh, you know, especially if you listen to him afterwards, as far as what that meant to him, just again, with essentially having 2021 as a lost season for him and then just, getting back healthy among other things and getting to start the first preseason game off that way. It's got to just boost his confidence a hell of a lot more moving forward. hundred um, percent. Quick correction, three catches, 28 yards. For Excuse Joshua me. Kelly, but that's okay. Uh, who's counting? Um, yeah. So Joshua Kelly, oh, there are good. people that are counting. <laughs> so, okay. So starting off looked pretty good. And honestly, starting off defense looked pretty good too. I think they held the, the ran and Chris Rump. That's when Chris Rump got a sack on the next drive on defense. Man, which, oh man. Chris Rumpf, let's talk about him. Again, we're going to go quickly over kind of just overall, and they'll get into individual players. But Chris Rumpf overall looks strong. I think he had two tackles for a loss. Should have had two sacks. Ended up having one missed tackle on Bryce Perkins, which I think he and Egbule both had missed tackles on that later on. Um, Chris Rumpf, edge three, it seems, along with Kyle Van Noy, depending on how things go at linebacker. But like Chris Rumpf, people talked about him all the time. People talked about him offseason-wise in terms of how much he's bulked up and how much he loves the game. We all know his personality. Um, came out strong, man. He had a bull rush that he had on that sack, and I was like, that's a grown man sack. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, didn't want to sneeze in the mic. <laughs> we are on live television, but I didn't want everybody to hear that. Uh, Dan, I was going to actually ask what your reaction, because considering that Chris Rump, you know, no, don't try to hide it, because... He's your boy. Yep. If anybody wants documentation of this, you go back from two years ago and you can actually find video footage of Dan Walkenstein literally hitting the roof in his own home when the Chargers take Chris Rump. <laughs> okay, yeah, not literally. I cannot hit the roof. I, I, I can't jump that high. <laughs> Pretty close. Pretty close. Your excitement level was through the roof. Yes, there we go. Much. There we go. Uh, so I'm sure you were elated when you were watching this taking place. But Dan, I tweeted it. The way that Chris Rump was looking... Um, the power that he has showed off, the added strength that has come through that has not only shown up in, in preseason game number one, uh, but throughout practices as well. I mean, you could see that this was a different Chris Rump. Joey Bosa has alluded to it to say he's not he's not a, he's not a string bean anymore. He's more like an asparagus. And then I tweeted, I said, Chris Rump may end up being a cucumber by the end of this game, if, if that's what we're going by judging on the sizes. <laughs> but uh, fantastic start for him. Great job when when, it, when it's we're talking about guys that need to step up in this additional three and fourth position, especially just behind the Joey Boses, behind the Khalil Max at a very, very key position. When we're talking about getting to the quarterback and Chris Rump. Great start for him showing out like that. Yeah, had some tackles for loss, had the sack, uh, should have had more. And honestly, it was amazing seeing him like literally flexing on folks as he's getting some of these tackles. Uh, you love to see it. Chris Rump, again, 
He's not going up against the ones, which again, if you're watching this game, literally there was like nobody on the starting offense or defense playing. So yes, he's going up against the twos, but still he's dominating the twos, which is what you want to see. Uh, then Jake, I guess this kind of gets get into the, the rest of it, right? I think we saw in no particular order. We saw Isaiah Spiller have a really good day. It was impressive. The numbers don't look it, but the eye test, I think it was like 10, 10 rushes, 30, 34 yards, something like that. Um, really good in pass protection, really good in terms of decisiveness as a runner. Um, and then other, other public on offense, other than the linemen, of course, uh, Michael Bandy, have a day, sir. Um, I don't know if he's going to make this this team purely because of who else is in re- who's that receiver, but he is going to be on an NFL team, and that's going to hurt if it's not ours. Six receivers is hard on a roster like this. It really is, and he's not going to beat out DeAndre Carter, but Michael Bandy looked good. I mean, he was open all day. He's kind of like the one like safety valve for both quarterbacks. And that whip route he had oh, broke ankles. I got beautiful. a video of it on Twitter. I was actually seeing it live. 10 yards separation with that whip route uh, for the touchdown. So Michael Bandy, man, I think Matt, uh, my Smith calls him the Bandy man. Uh, I like that. He's impressed. Dude. He's impressed throughout camp and he's impressed week one. I mean, nobody took over really the race for wide receiver six in this, in this matchup because Joe Reed and Michael Bandy were both performing at a very, very good clip. Hold my um, beer. Hold my beer. Exactly. That's basically what it <laughs> felt like, essentially. Dan, I don't know, man. Michael ba- Michael Bandy, to me, is going to be very, very hard for the Chargers to cut. And I'm, I'm in the same boat and rooting for Joe Reed. Given the talent that we've seen throughout practice, and now you start off preseason game number one like this, I would really like to see the Chargers keep six receivers. I would. And here's my prediction, actually. You saw the work that Joe Reed got in kick return duties. I'd like to see because you had both Bandy and Joe Reed both have very productive games in this one. I wonder if now, because we saw so much of this in practice, if now Bandy is going to get the kick return duties in game number two against the Cowboys. And just to see, okay, well, what type of separation can we can we make here? Because especially when we're talking about a wide receiver six, Sometimes it's going to come down to these contributions on special teams and who's going to be able to separate themselves. So Michael Bandy looked good, man. He looked very, very good. It's a bummer from the standpoint on the final drive of the game Uh, that Easton Stick was orchestrating and that that just ended up being a quote-unquote interception. But uh, that one I don't actually blame on Bandy given where the throw was and just, you know, how how are you going to go away from that? The defender just so happened to be in the perfect position in order to take the ball away. But outside of that, dude, Bandy just Bandy looked very very good. And um, seven seven receptions, seventy three yards, touchdown, eleven targets. It's going to be really hard to keep him off this roster. Yeah, but I think you know. Please don't that, please don't make this the next Tyron Johnson. But if the, I could the, just the go out of the limb and say it, the thing is going to be if he makes this roster, then you're going to probably if if he's on the roster, there's probably only going to be three running backs. Because I think there's a guy who yep. also played on on Saturday who didn't have the greatest game, uh, Larry Roundtree, uh, pretty ineffective. Uh, we saw some of the other running backs in there a bit. We saw Letty Brown get a few receptions. You saw. I think it was um, uh, Kevin Marks, I think, had a, either a missed drop or two, uh, which, again, in the preseason, you only have a finite amount of attempts to make an impact. And when the impacts you're making are negative, uh, it doesn't bode well for the future game. And so I think in terms of like stock up, I think Lady Brown probably went up a little bit. I would say Isaiah Spiller and Joshua Kelly both went up a bit. I would say... Layer Roundtree kind of went down, maybe. Marks, maybe even, maybe a little bit down. So take that for what you will. Um, elephant in the room, Jake. Chargers lose 29-22. Just going to put that out there. It doesn't matter, obviously. Final scores don't matter. Like, no one cares. <laughs> but there's always going to be the handful of people that care. Yes. And that yes. will make and we love you biggest too. deal about it, too. And we love you, too. Um, so offense, let's kind of go to offensive line for a second. We talked about receivers. We talked about Chase, Chase, Stanley, Easton stick, both honestly, like played pretty good. 
Um, okay, I think there were some positive and negatives from I, from each. Um, weird Chase Daniel with the wheels. Did you see that like twenty yard run or whatever it was? Like Isaiah Spiller was walking for him. I'm like, who, who is this? <laughs> <laughs> Chase Daniel, Easton Stick. Chase Daniel does seem to have, I don't know if lost, but his velocity to the sidelines. You saw in a couple passes that he was trying to get to, to Josh, Josh Palmer. Palmer. Yeah. It wasn't, just, it wasn't definitely wasn't the best. No. Um, but in terms of like managing the game, both he and Easton stick did. Okay. There's that one crazy long drive by Easton stick. That was like 15 plays. I think in the fourth going into the fourth quarter um, overall did pretty good. So quarterback two, three, like we could talk about it, but it doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. I mean, again, to some people it matters, Dan. We talked about this on the live show. You know, there is that contingency of people that believe that Easton Stick is that guy. And, Do you? you? Know, I, well, I I haven't thought that, but I will stand by this because I'm always one for owning my mistakes. Look, that game on Saturday was probably the best that I've ever seen Easton Stick look. And that's going it all the, the way back It was the good version. Yes, that was going all the way back to his preseason games as a rookie where he had that long run in for a touchdown that every, that really started the fire about him. And, 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 and I get it, but it's, it's, it is really funny, Dan. It's just like, that was not the Easton stick that we have watched in training camp the last couple of weeks, nope. but Easton stick came to play. And I thought from and at, from an athletic standpoint, obviously he has an advantage over, over sure. Chase Daniel in that regard. But I thought as far as Majority of his passes going through his progressions. I thought they were crisp. I thought they were on the money. I thought overall he played a very, very good game with all things considered. And again, you have that one interception at the end of the game, which was unfortunate because you actually felt like, okay, we're driving. They were driving. This this is good. Letty Brown season. We could be seeing overtime in a preseason (laughs) game for God's sakes. Um, So, yeah, I mean, I thought it and. You know, this this is sim- similar to the case of offensive or specifically right tackle, which we'll talk about here in a second. But Easton Stick will probably get the nod to start this coming Saturday against the Cowboys. And this is how it'll rotate, essentially, for the last two games here between Chase Daniel and Easton Stick. And, and who knows? I mean, the expectation is that most people believe that the Chargers will once again keep all three quarterbacks. So I don't think that even though it's not personally what I would do with my philosophy, I'd like to use that. You know, <laughs> I'd like to use those players elsewhere and in terms of overall depth, but that's the expectation. So we'll just see who ultimately ends up. Is there going to be a change at QB2 by the time preseason is done with? And this wasn't a bad start to that competition. No. So let's get into the offensive line, Jake. So pass blocking, run blocking. I'm going to bring up some PFF stats, uh, take them with a grain of salt. Uh, but I think it does help kind of for the most part uh, show a trend. Um, Brandon Hymas, Storm Norton, Zach Bailey, respectively, those are the three highest pass blocking rates, 82.4 for Storm for Brandon Hymas, 79.6 for Storm Norton, and 76.8 for Zach Bailey, which I think the more telling number is looking at the other side. They have Jamari Sawyer at a 53.2 pass block rate, which I don't agree with. And they had Trey Pippins at a 34, which 34 compared to Storm Norton, 79. That's a big discrepancy. They have Storm Norton, zero pressures, zero hurries. They have Trey Pipkins with one hurry and one pressure. So that kind of tells you why. But overall, like I think the offensive line did pretty good. Like I think we saw Zion Johnson look pretty darn good uh, in pass protection, Um, although they wouldn't say it, they being PFF. Um, Weirdly, Jake, they had a 24.3 pass block rate for (laughs) for Zion Johnson. Um, but what were your takeaways from the offensive line as a whole from a pass blocking perspective? Did I mean, pass blocking, it make you feel better or worse? You know, pass blocking, I mean, obviously it's not going to be immaculate. You're not going to get the same type of production that you would get with all of your ones in there. But I thought for having the playing time that Hymas got with the fact that you have two rookies and Zion Johnson and uh, Jamari Salar in there, I thought they did very well. Foster Sorrell probably had the worst day of, of all the offensive linemen, considering the amount of pressures that he gave up. Again, I really enjoy PFF. Five, I think a lot pressures, of the stuff that they that they do and they equate is on the money. I just still don't understand how they grade out offensive linemen like this. You know, just for context purposes, you can look at what they gave Trevor Penning, but then you could look at highlights of him just totally getting spun around and giving up a pressure there. 
And then just the scores just don't seem to add up, whether we're talking about that compared to Storm Norton or even Storm Norton compared, compared to Trey Pipkins, just if we're talking about one single pressure here. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I don't get it. But but you're, from, but you're right. Foster Sorrell, three hurries, five pressures, not a good day. Correct. So o- overall, majority of the offensive linemen, I thought, did a good job. Not perfect by any means, not elite by any means, but it's stuff stuff that you can build on, stuff that the coaches are going to go back and watch film on. And hopefully, if we're talking about the the likes of Solar, Hymas, and Zion Johnson here, that they're all going to feel the need to approve that. Now, what's the biggest thing that we're all looking at when it comes to the offensive lineman? Of course, that's right, t- right tackle. Good day for Storm Norton. You can't take anything away from him on that, even if we are t- talking about limited playing time. It's and a then pretty it good day for over. Pipkins, too. I mean, it, wasn't it, wasn't, bad yeah, it, wasn't, it wasn't a bad day for either one of these guys. But now, much like the uh, battle for QB 2 and 3, essentially, it's going to flip. So now, this next coming week, we'll see Trey Pipkins take the first snaps of the game, and then it'll switch back to Storm Norton. Um, so again, we're, we truly are not going to know what is going to happen at the right tackle position until probably the week before the regular season game. So hold tight because we're not going to be getting any answers on that anytime soon. Yes, but promising wise, from a run blocking perspective, Jamari Sawyer looked darn good. And I think he has the potential to be a starting guard quicker than I think folks would have thought. I could see him starting as quickly as like beginning of next season. Apologies my pronunciation of Sawyer's name keeps coming out <laughs> incorrectly. So I'm sure that if people haven't hammered me by now, I will fix that. I promise. <laughs> it's okay, Jake. No one's judging. Um, yeah. So Jamari Sawyer looked pretty good. 82.1 run block grade on PFF. Zach Bailey actually looked pretty good as well from a run blocking perspective. Um, Zion Johnson, I thought looked really good, although PFF would argue otherwise. But again, we don't understand PFF grades from when it comes to offensive line, offensive linemen. Um, but overall, I would say they look pretty good. And I think it's kind of a combination. I think you saw the run game kind of doing pretty well from an offensive line perspective, but also from a running back perspective. There is less dancing around in the backfield than we've seen in years past. And I think that is purposeful. Like I, I, I want, again, I don't know this. I have no sources, but I'm wondering if that's like an emphasis from the running backs group of like enough of that, like just get down, get vertical. And so um, I like that. Even Spiller, like looking at his run attempts, he didn't have I think like 3.4 yards per carry, but yeah, like it, the it, way he got them, that's what they got him for. Like they're not right. getting him to go get that, you know, Tyreek Hill crazy play. Like they're, they're there for the fourth and one, third and twos, being able to kind of efficiently move the chains. True. And let's, let's also not forget this. That is not the offensive line that Isaiah Spiller will be running behind. So anybody that's even saying that Isaiah Spiller had a bad day, look at the full context of what you're looking at. Right, yes. (laughs) One, that's false. And two, look at the full context of what you're looking at. So I think given the circumstances and what he did in limited time and being able to show his versatility, both in the run and the passing game, I thought he did a very good job behind that offensive line. All right. So moving over to the defensive side, talks about Chris Rumpf, had a pretty good day. Um, interior defensive line, I think honestly had a, uh, some of them had a some of them, <laughs> some of them had a good day. Some Mor- of them. You saw Morgan Fox. I mean, that guy, I think Brandon Staley after the game kind of had him pegged as like one of those football playing Jesse's. He had an interview with Matt Money and DJ, and he called him kind of a football playing Jesse and how much he impacts the game. You saw that immediately. Uh, Brandon Fajoko also, <laughs> I thought, looked very good. Keep it coming. Christian Covington had uh, some positive plays. You didn't see some positive plays from some other guys. Mm. Doesn't bode well. And like everyone, everyone talked about this needing to be the time that Jerry Tillery steps up. This is the time that he can make or break his roster spot. And to go ghost. I mean, not, that's not good. Was there any, good. was there anything on the stat sheet for him? Because even just look, even looking through uh, ESPN's full box score of this, he does not even come up on the stat sheet. I just wanted to make sure that I was double checking myself by looking at this. And I'm like, he didn't even register on the stat sheet. He does not. Zero sacks, zero hits, zero hurries. 
I mean, you said now, the best and went ghost. Now, now flip that. Like you look at some of the other guys that were on the, let's look at the interior perspective first. Like we talked about Morgan Fox. Like he looked good. And Morgan Fox, when they brought him in, he was the guy that they thought like, that's probably going to be the one who ends up taking over for Jerry Tillery. And you kind of saw it. He had an 89.2 pass rush grade as an interior defensive lineman. You'll take that. One hit, two hurries, and 43% win rate. I'll take it. Cole Christensen actually had a pretty good day as well. Linebacker. He had a good day. Um, so, yeah, it, it's not good. Um, there was one, I don't know if you saw this, but uh, Otito, f- fifth round draft pick, had two hurries. I think, he did. was he the one that got tackled by Egbele or vice versa? When they were supposed to get a sack, <laughs> that knocked him out of the play. Yes, I thought it was. I thought it. I thought he took out Rump in that play. I don't remember, but there I was, could be wrong. Otito definitely tackled someone that was not on the opposing team. <laughs> um, but Fajoko looked really good. I think he had seven pass rushes, I believe. Which I was like, dang. Um, for, for a guy who is known best for his run block or yeah, his, his run blocking capabilities, as far as what he's done on the interior defensive line, going back last year, statistically, he was one of the better interior defensive linemen on this team when it came to run blocking. Yes. And real quick, I, I misspoke. I did not mean Fahoko. I meant Egbele. Egbele oh, okay. had seven hurries in this game. He's kind of all over the place, kind of had an up and down game, but Fahoko looked good. And you could tell there was an interior presence that, there wasn't from other people just leave it there um so in terms of kind of what that interior defensive line looks like or just defensive line in general if if tillery was on the high end of that purely based off of precedence purely based off of a first round draft pick purely based on name i don't know how he could still be there after that Fahoko has earned himself this roster spot. I don't care if we're talking about this game. I don't care if we're talking about the practices in training camp that we have seen him perform very well on. Even you going back to last year and looking at those stats, you're talking about a guy who has earned his way up. This is his opportunity to get more starting time, even with the rehaul that the Chargers essentially did in reshaping the interior of their defensive front. And he has gone out. And when you're talking about consistency, this guy is always at least making some type of play. And it may not be the flashiest play. You could have a pressure from him here and there because I think that's definitely showed up in training camp as his pass rushing skills have definitely improved. And especially when we're talking about stopping the run, that is his bread and butter. That's what he knows what to do. And I think for a key depth standpoint, and when you're talking about the philosophy that this team should be focusing on, especially based off of what they did last year and how they were just gashed by the run. Someone with Fahoko's skill set is exactly what you need on this team. So to me, Dan, this is academic. If Fahoko is kept off this roster, whether it's for Jerry Tillery or anybody else. I don't know how you can keep him off the roster. I don't know how you can keep him off the field. I don't know baffling to me so so in terms of hurries you had egg who had seven hurries you had jamal davis i got another camp star four hurries you had morgan fox two hurries you had otito with two hurries and then rump christensen gaziano and that's it all had one hurry um so from a pass rush perspective i think it was kind of the egg davis and chris rump show that's kind of how i saw it um linebacker you know it, it's it's a it's a Did question you? mark right now. It's a question mark. I, it's it's not the best when you have three linebackers that lead your team in tackles, essentially, because that just meant that the <laughs> that the Rams were getting whatever they wanted over the middle. So it's mm-hmm. it's you gotta look at the stats both ways, but still to have Troy Reader, I thought actually looked he pretty looked good. good in certain I situations. Was impressed. I agree. I, I like the speed that he actually hit some of the holes with and coming up and making tackles. Damon Lloyd again. This is what like I he belongs. This is what I want to see. And you know, let's let's take everything that we have seen and heard from training camp and let's adopt that into an actual game against a different opponent. And I thought he looked great. Second in the team in total tackles, 
but five total solo tackles that led the team in that category. And then one tackle for a loss. I mean, I thought he looked great. And in a position right now where there's a bunch of question marks when it comes to depth, this is the type of player that you need. And hell, we didn't even get really a chance to see the coverage skills that he has shown in training camp in this game, because those skills are just as equally impressive as what he did uh, in this game. So Damon Lloyd, great step for him in terms of making it difficult for this team to keep him off this roster. Yes. Before we get into the secondary, which I know was a very hot button item, hot topic for lots of folks in this game. Uh, Jake, you know what position we didn't talk about in the offense was fullback. Oh yeah. Uh, Xander Horvath sighting. Two back-to-back plays. I believe the first one, he got tackled immediately, which caused them to have to go for it on fourth down, which I was actually surprised he didn't get the first down then. But then fourth and one, fullback dive, he gets the first down. Mm -hmm. You'll take it. So the Xander group, they're probably ecstatic right now. Uh, He didn't really see much um, offensively anyways, other than that and pass blocking. Um, So this is probably where I think there was the most, let's call it tribulation and trials. That's a nice way to put it. Was the Charger secondary. And mm-hmm. I think that you and I may have a differing viewpoint on this in terms of like what the takeaways are. Um, so I'm going to let you go first, Jake. So we saw Dean Leonard give up some some plays, both on the two-point conversion. I think he gave up two other catches that were pretty big. There's also some DPIs in there from him, Asante Samuel Jr., uh, there's also a few, there are two other DPIs as well. Um, defense in general, I think a lot of penalties p- specifically from the secondary. Um, there were some positives from there too, but I'll give you kind of the floor first. Like, what was your viewpoint on the overall performance of the secondary versus expectations? Again, we're talking about like se- what fifth, sixth, seventh string. Yes, that's what we're talking about here. To others, you know you just take it as a sign of this organization is trash as what people would say. They don't know should be fired. Properly. You know, screw those seventh round picks that are playing up against third stringers in their first actual NFL game against uh, somebody that they haven't played in practice for the past two and a half, two and a half weeks. Woo. <laughs> Bravo. Uh, imm- immaculate take. No, my takeaways, Dan, were just look, it's, it, it's it's nothing that can't be fixed. If you really thought that these guys were going to come out of the gate and be world leaders, you need to reevaluate the way that you're thinking about this defense. It's what I hearken it on is I thought, yes, it was a bad day for Leonard. Definitely not looking good, but it's nothing that couldn't be fixed. If we're talking about him getting burned for, which obviously he 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 definitely had some bad moments where he was out of position in this game. You know, he got beat on that long 60-yard touchdown that ended up happening, had his had a couple of pass interference penalties where literally hold, hold he was Wait. right in Okay, hold go on. Ahead. I I would push back. I don't think he was really out of position. And I think that was kind of the well, thing No, 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 that... that's that's what I was saying. He he wasn't necessarily he wasn't necessarily out of position. His coverage was great. It was just a simple thing of if you get your head around Okay. That that call may not end up happening. So it would be more concerning to me, right? It'd be more concerning to me if he's five to 10 yards off the opposing wide receiver and getting beat as opposed to a play like that on the sidelines where yes, it may seem like the most trivial and fundamental thing to do to just do this and maybe not get flagged for it. But what I also thought, Dan, is I hearken back to defensive coordinator, Ronaldo, Ronaldo Hill, when he was speaking about, guys like Dean Leonard, guys like Jasir Taylor. He's talked about, you know, they haven't been a straight line throughout practices. I know for Dean Leonard, he started off very, very hot when training camp got underway. But what has he talked about? He's talked about when these guys fail, they respond. They come back and they respond. They don't back down. So, yes, not a good sign. Not the best of days for Dean Leonard coming out of the shoot. But let's see how the next week goes. And the next week goes. Yeah, and, and I think that kind of bodes true for a lot of the guys on defense. You could talk about Dean Leonard in that category. You could talk about JT Woods in that category, Brandon Sebastian in that category. Um, I will say, I think like Jazeera Taylor, Keeman Hall, both had pretty good days. Um, but like, I, I think the thing to remember, and this is 
where I kind of felt a little optimistic. Like, yes, you don't like to see your corners give up 60 yard touchdowns and you don't like to see your corners give up DPIs, Asante Samuel Jr. included. But what you do like is that I think Brandon Staley talked about it pro game. He talked about the fact that although they gave up penalties, they gave up catches. The thing that he liked was the fact that they were in phase, which I believe means like they were there in position to make the play. They weren't getting beat physically. Right. It almost was like they were kind of getting beat mentally. And the hard part, they got figured out. Like it's not easy to athletically stay with the receiver through the entire route tree. The easy part is, hey, when you get to that catch point, we get to the point of of conflict, turn around. Because that's the part that is somewhat simple. The fundamental part is simple. Like you can't teach athleticism. You can't teach getting a guy to cover well, which I think they did do well. And so I noticed like every time I was seeing a Dean Leonard pass either completed or P- or pass interference, I'm like, man, that was a crazy catch. But like he was there. Like if he just turned around, like that would have been a PBU or interception possibly. So uh, I kind of was a little feeling a little optimistic in terms of like the overall big picture of what you would get from Dean Leonard. Uh, I think Jazir Taylor played pretty good in the slot. Um I think there was one part, I think it was Jazir Taylor and one other person who there was that that third and goal, I believe it was. Uh, and they had the run stop by, I think Rose was their running back. They had a run stop and then they both basically missed the tackle and they ended up turning around and getting in for a touchdown. Um, fundamentals, again, got to be able to wrap up. But like generally speaking, like to put it in perspective, guys, we're talking about a seventh round draft pick, UDFAs, six round picks, there's a reason why these guys were sixth, seventh, and UDFAs. If they were, you know, if they were seventh round draft picks and they're balling out beating your twos and threes, like they wouldn't have been drafted in the second right in the seventh round. Like there's a reason for that. And so you're looking at progression, you're looking at it on a whole. Getting out there and getting snaps is kind of what you need to see. Yeah, um, I, I think I think if you were to if you were to summarize the, the biggest negative that needs to be worked on. And we're talking about through, through the entirety of the defense here. We're not singling out anybody and saying this. And unfortunately, this is a phrase that we have heard too much about over the last couple of seasons, missed tackles. Now, just be happy that we're talking about preseason here. So hopefully you can correct these things moving forward in the next couple of weeks. But Dan, that was that was evident throughout the game on defense, not picking on any one individual player, not picking on any one individual position that was evident throughout. That's probably the one biggest takeaway that I would say, okay, if there is a key area for improvement that I want to see a dramatic jump in over the next two weeks, that has to be it. Yeah. Uh, and to that point, Amike Egbule, three missed tackles, Troy Reader, two missed tackles, Chris Rump had a missed tackle, Raheem Lane had a missed tackle. Brandon Sebastian had a missed tackle. Jamal Davis had a missed tackle. And I honestly think there was more. I think that's three, four, five, six, it, seven, it eight. It felt nine. like it. There it was felt more than like that. It. There was more than that. So uh, that has to get fixed. And some of those missed tackles led directly to points. Like mm-hmm. the, I think it was Egbule and Chris Rumpf both had a missed tackle on the same play, which led to uh, their quarterback scrambling out, getting a first down, and then a few plays later gets touchdown. Or simply like, not getting off the field and allowing a drive to keep going. Yeah. So that's important. Um, we can't finish the episode, Jake, without talking about special teams. <laughs> and I something, thought this is something this that is, you have taken great pride in over the last month, essentially. And not just not just hang time. Come on now. We're not going just operational stopwatches. Um, but we'll start there. Sure. Uh, there's a few times where you noticed there was like kick catch interference called on the chargers. Or it was like very close. There was something that looked strange. And you're, you're wondering, like, oh, what is the gunner doing? Why is he doing that? And then you realize, like, well, it's because the ball's been up in the air for 47 seconds. And so what else are you supposed he, to do? He almost timed it perfectly. <laughs> almost but, like, timed it perfectly. What does that say when you can have kick catch interference? I mean, one, you have to show a little bit more discipline on your coverage unit. Okay. Yes, From a but, com- but to your point... I see what it is you're trying to do. You're allowing you it, it, what it is. It's, it's it's allowing your guys to get down there to ta- to make the play, to make the stop, to make the tackle. That's hang what time. that hang time is doing. Yes. So, I mean, very impressive. What was it, Dan? Four point eight seven. Four point what it was for J.K. Scott. Four punts. And in comparison, I think Ty Long was like what? I think he had was four point two average. 
I, I don't know what it was. That's over half you, a second difference. When you now, see how hang time, this? I don't know. Right. But when you see how hang time ultimately translates to its contribution in the coverage unit, yes, obviously coverage unit takes a hell of a lot more discipline and aspects to beat your guy down the field to make a play, but a hang time has a little bit to do with it as well. So let's not negate the relationship between the two. So I get it. And from a special team standpoint, Outside of that one little misfire on the early tackle before the receiver, the opposing receiver caught From it. From a five plus second hang right. time kick. <laughs> okay. Right. I was okay with it. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Uh, no miss extra points, no miss field goals. So that's the non story. We'll take it. Uh, there was, it was kind of interesting to see kind of the folks on special teams like Joe Reed got a lot of run at kick returner. And there weren't any negative plays there. Like there was one where he probably could have gotten more on a return, but um, overall pretty chalk. Uh, we didn't see any crazy punt returns. Uh, that was pretty normal, uh, but I would say JK Scott, probably the winner of special teams of special teams day. Um, otherwise big picture, anything else from a takeaway perspective? You know, I think we thankfully got out of it without any injuries, which I think is like, in terms of priorities, like one A, one B performance, performance. That that should be everyone's mentality at this point of the year. I don't care if someone beats us down 34 to nothing, as long as nobody's getting injured in the process, that's really all I care about. Yep. Um, JT Woods, I think had a little bit of an up and down day, which I think is to be expected. Uh, I think the things that he's good at, you saw, I think the things that he needs improvement on, you also saw, Uh, whether it was angles, whether it was tackling, um, but like the click and close was pretty good. Um, but overall, I would say the folks who won the day, Jake, it seemed like I think all rookies played. And for the most part, you saw Zion Johnson as advertised. You saw Isaiah Spiller as advertised. JT Woods, for good or for bad, as advertised. Otito, I think, was looked pretty good. Didn't look bad. Uh, Dean Leonard, seven on draft pick. Brandon Sebastian, those guys not great, but also you can't really rely on your sixth and seventh round draft picks to like all of a sudden make this squad, especially this squad with a secondary that is this deep. But overall, I think the the rookies played pretty good. And if you can go back to back years, Jake, having rookie impact, like we did last year with the Asante Samuel juniors and the Rashawn Slaters and the, the come on. <laughs> Who are you talking about? Honestly, the, the... Neiman. Nick Neiman. There we go. Thank you. That's what I was looking for. If you can get impact from rookies back to back years like that, like that's what makes a roster title contending. You have to be able to get performance and production out of those guys. So I think kind of the big stories, rookies got a lot of playing time. Got to see a lot of performance from the guys who you expect to make impacts on the team. Yep. Again, from the guys you expect to make impacts on the team you saw. And then otherwise, I think it was, it's gotta be Michael Bandy. It's got to be Chris Rumpf, Joshua Kelly, Joshua Kelly, Isaiah Spiller. Those that's probably kind of the four main takeaways from the, and maybe Jamari Sawyer as well. I would put him there too. I think he played, he was drafted way later than I think folks thought he would get drafted. And you're seeing why, like he, he, he looked at, he looked pretty good. He doesn't look like someone who's drafted late rounds. If we, if we're, if we're looking at, and however you want to rate them on your own, by all means do Two of the key positions that is really vying for a roster spot, a potential wide receiver six, the guys that we wanted to show out for that, they both did it in Bandy and Reed. Brennan Fajoko, who to me should no question be making this roster, but for whatever case, if some people want to say he's still on the outside looking in, it shouldn't be that way. His roster spot should be solidified. And personally, that should have happened like, a couple weeks ago, in my opinion. But I'm glad that he got that opportunity to prove what he can do, and hopefully that continues moving forward and gets him his deserved roster spot. Joshua Kelly, we've all been wondering who the hell is going to take up this mantle on RB3. I think Joshua Kelly, when we said it on Saturday, he had the lead, not by much. I think he widened that gap considerably. Really? Yeah, yes, I do. If we're talking about the difference between him, Larry Roundtree, Kevin Marks, and Letty Brown, yes, as of this moment right now, he has yes 
He's got he's got that RB. Yeah, that does it, yeah, RB2. So you're saying RB2 Spiller, RB3 Kelly? RB2, yes. RB2, I think okay. we would figure, is still going to be Spiller. If if we're talking about RB3, I think Kelly has a firm grip on that right now. Yes, and I think from there, there's a pretty wide gap between mm-hmm. RB3 and the rest. Yes. And I honestly don't even know if I would have Roundtree as RB4. I don't know. I think all of that's kind of a toss-up. Dan, tell me right now, would you rather keep a Damon Lloyd or a Brennan Fajoko on this team over an RB4? Yes. <laughs> in a heartbeat. There you go. Yep. Yeah. Um, so, no, overall, I would say it was a success in terms of preseason week one. You know, a lot of these guys uh, got to play, got to have meaningful snaps. I guess maybe the last question I have for you, Jake, maybe this would be a good way to end this. Were there any questions that we had going into tra- into preseason week one that were now, like, answered? I think for, like, for me, what comes top of mind a lot of questions, a lot of hype around Chris Rumpf. I think that was answered. I think mm-hmm. we saw some juice from him. Um, same thing with Brandon Fajoko. I think we saw like some juice for that. And then Isaiah Spiller. Again, I know it was not a ton, but what you saw from him in terms of just the eye test, he belongs. He goes. He, he bounces forward. He doesn't lose yards often. And I'll be interested to see when he gets carries against the Cowboys and give it behind. Let's see if they flip it. Let's see if like, okay, Kelly did a great job mm-hmm. against the Rams and getting the, the first carries of the game. Let's see if they give Isaiah Spiller a chance to run between, you know, with the number twos essentially. And let's see how, if the production continues, because personally I think it would. Yeah, I'd agree. Um, so yeah. So what answers or what questions did you get answers to? I mean, I, I think it's I think it's kind of an answer and a question both at the same time because there really is it hasn't been answered yet, but should the Chargers keep six wide receivers on this roster? There's a very good case to why they should. <laughs> and and it's being known right now between Joe Van, or uh, Joe Reed and Michael Bandy. So we'll see if that if that Battle plays out the same way. If one guy is able to to pull away in that uh, position battle, I don't know, but it makes it sure as hell makes it entertaining, and it makes it hard to to not keep either one of these guys on this roster. Okay, so let me, let me ask this then, because I, I think you know it, it's easy to it's easy, but like there's one conversation of who would you rather have between Michael Bandy and Joe Reed? Like that's a isolated, which that's an argument in itself, but. When you get to the question of who would you rather have between whoever that is and Damon Lloyd, it's tough. It's tough. It's tough. And and I think if I was, I think if I was to have him to make a choice, but right now when you look at the scope of the roster buildup as it stands, I'm not going to back off what I have said for the last several months in looking at the depth at linebacker is arguably the weakest position on this team. Mm -hmm. So given that, and given the fact that you have Tranquil finally, thankfully, coming back from injury, you've had Kyle Van Noy stepping in uh, at that inside linebacker spot, you know, maybe temporarily, maybe permanently, we'll find out. But Kenneth Murray still coming back from injury, and that's a big question mark going into this season. And then you have the likes of Troy Reader and a handful of others. And we know that just from a standpoint, you know, this defensive scheme does not value the linebacker position that much. But when you look at the injuries that have already taken place there, can you risk not having that depth? Can you risk keeping the likes of Damon Lloyd off this team, given what he's given you in one preseason game in several training camp practices? If that was my choice that I had, unfortunately, I'd have to say Damon Lloyd because that's where the need is more. Yeah, I, I would agree with you. And I think the simple reason for it is when I look at potential production from that roster spot of either wide receiver six or linebacker, whatever number it is, you'll see Damon Lloyd filtering through that defense with way more meaningful snaps than he will whatever wide receiver six gets. And so in terms of the impact to the roster, impact to the team, I think it was Damon Lloyd. Last question. And I'm asking this for everyone. Uh, as we get to... Joint practice, the Cowboys. If you get to week two preseason against the Cowboys, Jake, who, listeners, viewers, who is now firmly 
we talk about hot takes cold beer. Who is in the hot seat on this Chargers team? It could be one player. It could be a few. But who is now firmly in the hot seat as we get to week two? Well, we've already kind of alluded to the person that's in the hot seat. It's it's definitely Jerry Tiller. He has to be at the top of that list. That's one. Um, Larry Roundtree, I think, is another Larry one. Larry Roundtree would be another one, yes. It's interesting, the battle in the secondary, because Alohi Gilman, since he's been getting more more reps with Mark Webb out due to injury during tra- training camp practices. You know, he didn't, he didn't blow the roof off of getting his opportunity, but I thought he actually played pretty well during those camp reps and elevated himself a little bit more. So we'll really see over these next two weeks. I think that that's a battle. Um, I still just can't see them getting rid of Mark Webb, given the things that the coaching staff has said and, how they've alluded to the expectations that they had for him last year before the injury. It's hard for me to say that he would be on the hot seat, but maybe Dan, maybe it'll be interesting for these guys like the Raheem lanes, the Brandon Sebastians, even between Lloyd and Jasir Taylor, because the big question is how many defensive backs are you going to keep as a group? And that's a tough one, given how much you have with this competition of young guys that have come in and that are battling for a roster spot. Um, those would probably be the ones that I would fixate on. Dan, here's here's probably the better prop bet to ask for this coming game. Are you ready for this? Will the Dallas Cowboys have more penalties called on them, or will the Chargers have more missed tackles? What will be the greater number? Ooh. Penalties from the Cowboys or missed tackles from the Chargers? Would they have like 17 penalties? 17 penalties. Skip Bayless said he, he counted 22. You know, five of them weren't weren't called. So For reference, the Chargers running. seemed like they had a ton of penalties. They had nine. So imagine almost doubling that. Yes. Uh, so, so more penalties that- from the Cowboys or more missed tackles from the Chargers? <laughs> I'm going to go more penalties from the Cowboys. I'm going to parlay that. <laughs> with uh, more carries for Isaiah Spiller than Joshua Kelly. Jake, anything else you want to tell the great friends other than to go to LAF Beef Network, go to the shop, use the promo code Unleashed, get your fourth and Staley shirt, get your fourth and Staley hat. You can get your rally towels. You can get your I'm not effing tired by Joey Bosa. Last call. Isaiah Spiller signed mini helmet giveaway taking place tomorrow. One last opportunity to get in there and uh, enter yourself in the contest. Make sure to follow the rules. We've tweeted it a million times now. So just go to the go to the Chargers handle, follow the rules, make sure you're entered in that. And then again, as we alluded to on the live show on Saturday, if you don't get this one, don't fret because there are plenty more giveaways to come that we might end up putting out later on this week. So maybe keep your maybe. eyes peeled. Yes. Um, last thing on that, Jake, keep, speaking of keeping your eyes peeled, the Chargers equipment room, the shop that they had over at SoFi, like they got some nice swag for this year. That's new. Uh, I got myself a sick hoodie. Um, I think I tweeted about it on Saturday. Um, it's kind of pricey, but like I was like, I can't not. I have to. I have to. So we definitely will be having some giveaways to kind of help folks take advantage of some of the new swag we got both from the store as well as that we have here. Again, Isaiah Spiller, mini helmet up for grabs. You have until... I think today's the last day, isn't it? Today's the last day. We'll today's the last day. Tomorrow. So uh, go have your chance to win that helmet. Uh, guys, thank you so much for tuning in. Chargers lose 29-22, but they win in lots of things that they have been able to take advantage of. Health being one of them, reps being another one, and rookie performances being another. Uh, thank you guys so much for tuning in to Chargers on Least. You can find Jake Hefter backwards hat at Jake Z Hefter, myself at Dan W Sports, and we'll talk to you next time on Chargers Unleashed.